Hello, I'm Susan Dixon with the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. I want to welcome you all. Um, we're still a few more people are uh, being admitted, but I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, some of you know our organization. The Chinese Historical Society of Southern California was formed in 1976, and we have been having uh, monthly meetings during the school year on the first Wednesday of every month. And we're all wel welcoming you uh, from across the nation now that we have Zoom. And so now our organization, the push has really been to research, record and spread information about the history of the Chinese in America. And so to that end, uh, we have a wonderful speaker tonight who's going to draw some connections between the past and what's happening in our current um, environment. So uh, we have three, um, well, we have two uh, co-sponsors with us. We have the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, and we also have the China Society. And so I just wanted to give the president of the uh, China Society a few minutes to welcome his group that have joined us. So uh, Bob Lee, you're on. Hi, um, I'm president of the China Society of Southern California. Uh, our organization was formed in 1935 and we, uh, Prior to the pandemic, we were having monthly dinner program meetings in Chinatown. Uh, we have cooperated with the Chinese Historical Society for many years. Uh, many times, if they had a great program that would be of interest to us, we would have the program following in a couple of months. Uh, since not, we're now on Zoom, we have co-sponsored meetings. I think one, one of the important things about this thing is um, that it's, it, it's going to give you a historical uh, view that uh, many of you probably were not aware of. I myself is, am an American born Chinese who was a baby boomer. And so I, I think I was very fortunate in that um, I didn't really experience much anti-Chinese sentiment when I was growing up, or maybe maybe I did and didn't know it because I was too young. And um, I think I had a typical American raising. I, I was born. I we lived essentially outside of Chinatown, even though the family had a store in Chinatown. And I mean, among the things I did was like, you, you can see me with a picture of riding, uh, uh, a picture of me on a pony with cowboy hat and whatever. And that was typical of uh, the, the Chinese kids of my generation. I think that, uh, that we really didn't learn that much about the anti-Chinese uh, feelings and I think in 1980, I think is when I really first became tremendously aware of a general anti-Chinese feeling. At the time, I had just become the president of the board of the China uh, of the Chinatown Service Center. The Chinatown Service Center was partially funded by the United Way, and United Way wanted us to do a fundraiser. And typically our fundraisers were dinners within our Chinese community. This fundraiser wasn't that, it was a mass mailing um, event, which I think they, they also uh, had uh, Steve Allen uh, co-sponsor the thing. And they sent out all these mailers. And if you knew what, the um, Chinatown Service Center was at the time, it was primarily a group that was giving translation services uh, to 
a lot of the new immigrants, and there were a lot of immigrants at that time, especially from Southeast Asia and, and from China. And what we were trying to do was make available programs that were available to the general public, except for the fact that our clients didn't understand English. They needed translation services. They needed uh, programs that were geared toward their language. And um, that was it. Anyway, we had the most unsuccessful fundraiser in the history of uh, the Chinatown Service Center. We actually lost money on the mailers and we got hate letters telling these immigrants, go home, we, we don't want you. You, should, you. you don't deserve the programs that everybody else in America was offered. And it really, it, it, it really shook me up. So I think that a program like this, I think will give some understanding to some of the problems that the Chinese have had and maybe shine some light on what this anti-Asian violence is today. Uh, now I'd like to turn over the program to uh, Eugene Moy, who is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Bob. And it's a kind of a, a great insight that you've shared with us about some of the things that we experience in our community. You know, we, we try to do good, try to help people, and uh, we get this backlash. So uh, rather than myself or, or trying to reach uh, any, any uh, uh, wrong conclusions, well, I think it's good for us to really hear from some people who have been doing deep research, some scholars who have analyzed some of the local political and sociological conditions that have led to our current challenge with anti-Asian violence. We have uh, seen, of course, uh, anti-Asian violence over the years um, in conjunction with various uh, political wins uh, that our government uh, through the US Congress or the president or whatever uh, forces have been driving our policy toward our Asian cousins and brethren, but it does require a, um, some, some deep thinking about why, how all of this is happening in our community. So uh, rather than uh, my talking anymore, I, I want to introduce our speaker. Gordon Chang, Professor Chang, is a professor of history at Stanford University. He's the Alv H. Palmer Professor of Humanities. He's currently serving as a senior uh, associate vice provost for undergraduate education. He's the uh, Stanford Alumni Association fellow in undergraduate education. I'm, I'm doing this, by the way, for you folks who don't see our newsletter, but uh, we're really impressed by really his uh, his record uh, his CV. He's the former director of the Center for East Asian Studies and of the Asian American Studies program. He's been on the Stanford faculty since 1991. That's 31 years, isn't it, Gordon? Anyway, he's also published quite a few books and uh, uh, been involved with the Stanford Chinese Railroad Worker Project, uh, published a, a couple of books out of that effort. Uh, he's been also uh, conducting research and writing about US-China relations, which is why he's the perfect person to discuss the, the topic he's gonna to talk about today. Uh, he did publish Friends and Enemies, the United States, China, and the Soviet Union, 1948, 1972. He's written about, uh, oh, he did produce a, uh, wrote, write a book called Fateful Ties, A History of China's Preoccupation with China. And I think that's what really caught my attention. And that's something I actually have in my library. And I need to go through more than just one chapter. <laughs> and in fact, that I think the best thing is to hear directly from the source. So I'd like to introduce 
Professor Gordon Chang. Gordon. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, thanks, Robert. Thanks, Susan. Um, happy to be with you and a uh, very nice introduction. Thanks. I, I'm, uh, I'm a historian, so I'm going to speak about history largely, but bring this to the present or really have our eye on the present as we look at the past and to think about the past and what it can tell us or shed some light on the present. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to be too formal here. I have a number of slides. I like to have images. I mean, people like to see images. I'll be speaking about these slides as we go along here and hope we can have a conversation. That is to say, um, I, I will go on for maybe 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and then we'll have a good time for some discussion. So please, uh, uh, later on, uh, raise points, questions, challenges uh, that uh, we can get into uh, after the presentation. So um, we all know about the anti-Asian violence that swept the country for the past few years. I, and I, a year and a half ago, I spoke to uh, the Historical Society uh, with more focus on the scope of the anti-Asian violence. But here I want to uh, talk a little bit more about some of the history of the anti-Asian violence, uh, and particularly with regards to the Chinese. Now, uh, I'll start off by saying, you know, people always want to know, well, why was, uh, why were Chinese so reviled and attacked in the United States in the 19th century? From the time Chinese began to come in some numbers to the United States in the 1850s, through the end of the century, uh, there was terrible violence directed against uh, Chinese uh, migrants who came here. Hundreds of murders in California alone, throughout the whole West, there was terrible uh, physical violence. Uh, every Chinese community uh, in the West, uh, in, from Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Tacoma, but all the scores of smaller communities from Montana westward were attacked, and many of them, most of them, burned down and destroyed. Uh, San Bernardino, uh, San Jose, all around, and many of you, I think, have, are aware of efforts now to memorialize uh, these terrible events. Now it's said uh, that about this violence, and, and we know this crests with the uh, passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Now why, why did all this happen against the Chinese? Well, people say, well, look, uh, China itself was a beleaguered country, barely a nation in the eyes of some toward the 19th century. And it was uh, seen as unmodern, backward, and therefore, its people also similarly uh, backward and deserving of mistreatment. Um, and so that's an argument for why uh, Chinese in America received such a terrible uh, treatment or, um, um, based upon certainly racial prejudice. But the, the, inter the violence against Chinese certainly has an international dimension, and that's the, one of the things which I'll return to repeatedly in the discussion that the international environment is critical to keep in mind as we try to understand why there has been violence against Asian American Chinese Americans and Asian Americans more generally. The bottom line is, as uh, some of you have heard, I'm sure, is that Asians in America, Chinese in particular, are seemed, deemed as perpetual aliens, perpetual foreigners that were never seen as fully part of the country. Uh, in part of some, you know, Robert's uh, story of what happened in the 1980 uh, is, is uh, illustrious, illustrates that point. But you can see this uh, political cartoon from the end of the 19th century about this prostrate dragon here, maybe once powerful, but now ugly and defeated and about to be butchered by the warring great powers uh, surrounding the carcass. Um, and, and that's sort of a metaphor for China, for Chinese people around the country at the time. Now, you compare that image, which is usually seen as part of Chinese history, with Chinese American history. We can see these uh, 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 advertisement on the left here, the terrible, demeaning uh, portrayal of Chinese. Again, you can see the Q, just as it was on the dragon, dead dragon, it gives us, it's a marker of Chinese uh, identity at that time. Uh, so just as the Chinese in China were seen as degraded, certainly Chinese here were so forth. You have a dead rat there, a dead dragon, and China's about to consume this rat. Uh, on the right, you have a magazine cover from a San Francisco magazine that shows this uh, devilish 
being, barely human, uh, not human at all, but uh, the source of all sorts of corruption and degradation of the white population, drugs, theft, uh, the uh, taking people's jobs. Uh, so the Chinese were seen beneath contempt in some ways and um, all part of a great mass of uh, uh, humanity that was not desirable. Uh, lots of political cartoons. I'm going through these somewhat quickly here. You can see these you may have seen before. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on them. Maybe sort of speak for myself as, as evidence of uh, dominant views of Chinese at the time, degraded, drug addicted, uh, and why white population can't compete against the Chinese, even though they're so degraded in opium addicts and so forth, eating rats, you know, here is a family, white family on the right here, uh, God bless our home, uh, which was the desired uh, uh, standard of American um, uh, Americans. And a statue for our harbor, uh, again, a ghoulish figure with the Q and how it ruined white labor. So this idea of ruination, the idea of competition, the Chinese are inferior, but also very difficult to compete against is something which I'll return to in a moment. Uh, the anti-Chinese sentiment was not just expressed by ruffians, but actually throughout many classes of society from white society from bottom to top, including intellectuals. This was a fellow who did a uh, printed this uh, book, guilt bound book called The Last Days of the Republic, which is interesting to take a look at, published in 1880. 1880, on the eve of the Chinese Exclusion Act, it's basically a novel, fictional account of the fall of the American Republic, Last Days of the Republic, supposedly because of the influx of Chinese and the conspiracy of Chinese against the American Republic, which results in this fat Mandarin sort of taking over uh, American capitals, the ruler of all lands. And we keep that in mind as we talk about, and get, and think today of how much China is again reviled, I call the new Sinophobia, the fear of China. Uh, even at the time when China was itself being dismembered, there was this, this simultaneous and sort of uh, contradictory view that, the, that China was, was also a threat uh, to other lands around the country because it was uh, sinister, uh, ambitious, uh, its people corrupt and evil. Uh, this novel goes into this, it's quite an extensive novel. Um, and you can, I've reproduced some of the text here of the last days, this, this, these, these are some of the illustrations. The ship of state glided noiselessly to her doom, that is to say, the American Republic was in peril, but uh, no one came to save it and no one was really aware of the power and danger of the Asiatic serpent, the Chinese serpent, uh, that, would, uh, cons uh, that would destroy America. And it sounds uh, far-fetched, but this was done in all seriousness. This was written in all seriousness, as you can see here. And the book purports to talk about the history of the actual fall of the American Republic. Now, for, as history, you know, this is sort of the future as history uh, genre. And uh, I could spend a whole hour talking about this, this uh, piece. It's pretty quite uh, interesting. And includes uh, the uprising uh, uh, that leads to the conclusion of the American Republic, uprising of Chinese laborers, workers who were in the country, who came to build the railroad, who came to do different work, and seem to be inoffensive uh, workers until one day they got the cue, uh, which is uh, the, the signal to uh, strip off their work vestments and they turned out to be a mass army that had come under false pretenses to attack Americans. And here you see the Chinese army uh, opening fire against a sort of a New England town and the people being mowed down in the background. I mean, incredible far-fetched image, but this is seen as a real possibility uh, for the country. The defeat of white Americans leads to Chinese 
taking over state governments throughout the South and the West, and finally uh, all the capitals, and finally the whole republic leads to, I thought, I thought I'm quite taken with this image, the governor of California. Uh, we haven't had a Chinese governor of California ever, but anyway, this was this, this was their fear. This was the image you do have this uh, sinister looking Mandarin uh, sitting in Sacramento. Now that uh, uh, there was a, a lot of other serious uh, uh, thought given to the danger of Chinese to America. Again, in retrospect, we can see how exaggerated, it seems so exaggerated, so extreme, but that's precisely the point. You have to think about the depth of the sentiment against Chinese and how fearful white Americans were against the class, but racial and civilizational, cultural uh, features of Asia and China is seen as somehow competitive and threatening to America itself. So on the left here, you see a cover page of a book, China, the Yellow Peril, this famous phrase, the Yellow Peril, at war with the world. Now, what was this book about? This book was about the Boxer Uprising, which began in 1900, um, and uh, where the, the, this uh, uh, mass movement rose up in, among the peasants to oppose Christianity, but to foreigners generally, and it was seen by the rest of the world, or Europe, as China rising up against the world, or that is the European presence in China. And so instead, of, uh, and then Europeans and then about a dozen countries gathered together and it actually invaded China. But you look at this cover and it's sort of inverted. So China at war with the world, but in fact, the world or Europe was invading China. Um, again, this idea of geopolitical danger and security is a theme that runs throughout this fear or what we call sinophobia. Um, we were talking about Samuel Gompers before this session began, and he's one of the authors of this pamphlet uh, on the right here, which is a fascinating title. I always I use this in my classes because it's so evocative and suggestive of, of the uh, thinking at the time. Meat versus rice, American manhood against Asiatic coolism, which shall survive. Well, it's, 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 it's intriguing because there's a suggestion of dominance, of strength, that is meat, American manhood against rice, which is seen as sort of inferior to meat. Asiatic coolism, certainly inferior to American manhood. But then it leads to the question, which one is it going to survive? Uh, is the dominant stronger man, uh, masculine side going to win or the weak uh, Asiatic uh, semi-slave Chinese or Asian side. And this was uh, coined, uh, written by, in part by Samuel Gompers, the leader or founder of the American Federation of Labor. Labor. And this was reprinted in 1908 as, as part of the effort, public effort to uh, get Congress to continue the Chinese Exclusion Act. Now, jumping up a little bit here, I talk about the intersection of international and foreign aspects. Uh, and this has not, this is not to do with Chinese, but deals with Japanese Americans. Uh, this theme of uh, the danger from abroad, of danger to America, uh, runs uh, quite prominently in American attitudes towards Asians in this country. We can talk about Filipinos and talk about Southeast Asians and all, all Asian groups seen as not really being uh, desirable as Americans, and but even more so uh, being dangerous to America. Now, this uh, cartoon says it all in many ways. This is by Dr. Seuss, who was liberal, uh, published uh, on the eve of uh, Japanese American incarceration. And you can see the portrayal of Japanese in his characteristic style uh, all along the West Coast, um, picking up dynamite, um, and ready to do evil, to do damage, waiting for the signal from home. Again, this ailing element waiting to do damage to the country. Uh, 
this this is a theme which leads, of course, to the uh, internment of Japanese Americans. The called uh, Roosevelt allowed the, U the army to round up to require all Japanese Americans along the west coast and along the Mexican border to uh, report to basically prison camps. Now for beginning in the spring of 1942 and lasting until 1945. Uh, we don't have time to go into the whole incarceration issue, but this is something I want to return to also in, in a few moments. And you see very powerful images such as this by those who wanted to protest this characterization of the danger of Japanese Americans to American life. This was taken by the famous photographer Dorothea Lang uh, of a store in Oakland. And the store owner, Japanese American, placed this big placard to make uh, his very powerful political statement. Um, to try to oppose this, uh, this hatred, this view of him as being uh, dangerously alien. And, but uh, he and others, uh, 120,000 Japanese Americans, went off to these internment camps. Now, the international dimension is, again, I'm skipping, not skipping around, but giving me sort of highlights here. And many of you know about the horrible death, the beating of death of Vincent Chin. Uh, now, the anniversary coming up on June 19th, um, where he was uh, killed. And I think there'll be commemorative events in, in uh, different places. This was in Detroit, where uh, he was uh, at a bar to, and then went outside the bar. And these two white auto workers uh, grabbed him, beat him up, and took, put, took out a baseball bat and beat him to, unconscious and then put him in a coma, and he died. Uh, uh, a few days later, a horrible death uh, of uh, that he suffered on the eve of his marriage. And uh, now, what was notable in this, and this is the why it's a turning point in many ways for Chinese Americans or Asian Americans in identity, is that they beat him up after calling him all sorts of anti Japanese slurs. And they said, he, people, SOBs like him, were responsible for they being unemployed. And even though he was Chinese American, his father had fought in World War II. Um, and, but this was uh, during the surge, high, high, the surge of, Ant of uh, US-Japan economic competition, you know, the, the auto com industry suffering for the arrival of Hondas and Toyos and so forth in the country. Uh, but it didn't matter that he was Chinese American, they still thought he was undesirable and called him these, these anti-Japanese names, even though he said you know, he, was, he, was, he was not Japanese. Uh, so this racial element that spans ethnicities is something which uh, is also a feature of anti-Asian violence, not just anti-Chinese violence. And I'm not sure if this was actually took place in Los Angeles. This was an event that featured Vincent Chin's mother calling for justice for his son, her son, because the murderers uh, received no jail sentence and were just given very light sentences. Uh, and here she is giving tragic, very heartfelt, painful testimony as to how she felt and what happened to her uh, son. Now, jumping up again, of this relationship between the international and the domestic, we see this with Trumpism. Uh, and Trump, uh, early on, as he started to think about the uh, political waters that led him to the White House eventually, uh, seized on this incipient anti-Chinese sentiment. Uh, U.S. and China, as we know, there was there was uh, growing there was economic competition as well as collaboration. You know, already in 2012, uh, so much of what we would buy in Walmart or Home Depot were made in China, and there was the sense that uh, uh, China was thriving because the United States was suffering, or the United States was suffering because China was somehow um, uh, not fairly competing with the United States, but ste stealing from the United States in various ways, in these nefarious ways, so this is in ridiculous ways that Donald Trump raised, such as this, that the very concept of global warming was 
falsely created by and for the Chinese to uh, make the U.S. industry non-competitive, and then we, you, the federal government, put all sorts of restrictions you know, on the environment and EP, on emissions and those of this type of thing. And that was just our own foolish self-dueling, according to Trump. Um, but this, we were duped by China. Again, the sense of Chinese being cagey, sneaky, um, resonated with Americans. As Iran, again, this came up repeatedly in his campaigns. Uh, and really in these incendiary statements, we talk about raping the United States and the greatest theft in the history of the world. And again, this is idea that, that America's doldrums, economic problems were due to China, that, that it was a scapegoat. There was more than a scapegoat. It was, it was the source of American unhappiness and problems that he carried all the way into the uh, White House. And then with COVID, and then we know about the Chinese virus and all this, this business, which he uh, scapegoated to China again, saying that the Chinese um, either deliberately or responsible for uh, COVID, that delivery was used to bring over here and to weaken the United States. Uh, and he repeatedly used the term Chinese virus as opposed to other terms, COVID, or even the China virus, but the Chinese virus is somehow the virus had a nationality. Um, and this continued uh, throughout uh, this. And this is, this, is no this is no coincidence that the rapid rise of anti-Asian violence, racial violence against people who looked Chinese, didn't matter they're Filipino, Latin American, uh, 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 Latino, uh, Japanese, Southeast Asian, uh, a lot of people took out their anger, hatred, uh, because of their unhappiness with COVID to um, well, on uh, Asian uh, Chinese appearing people. Uh, and again, this is this drumbeat of directed against Ch uh, Asians in China in particular. And interesting that he connects this to Pearl Harbor. You know, it's a sneak attack. Is somehow foreign? Is it against, uh, is it deliberate uh, against the country? Now, I want to look at a certain aspect of this fear of Chinese that may be unexpected, or, or I want to link it to something that some of you may know, some of you may not know. And that is the particular suspicion we've seen these days, but goes back, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, there's a history here, of particular suspicion against educated Chinese, not just Chinese workers and laborers, as we talked about before, but very well-educated, accomplished scholars and scientists. The most well-known of this is someone who lived down in your way in Southern California, out in Pasadena, a brilliant rocket scientist, engineer, Chen Shosun, who uh, grew up in China, uh, went to college in China, then went to MIT, and then went to Caltech and became a uh, professor and co-founder of the famous Guggenheim Jet Propulsion Lab there. Uh, and had a phenomenal career in the United States in the mid-30s through the 1940s, where he was literally one of the lit uh, uh, lead world's experts on rocketry and jet propulsion. Uh, so much so that in 1945, the U.S. Army uh, recruited him to uh, and, and, and admitted him into the put, put a uniform on him as a, a member of the U U.S. Army to go to Germany, occupied Germany, to review the German rocket facilities and to help interrogate German rocket scientists. So he was highly regarded for his scientific knowledge and for his help for national security at that time. But then by the end of the 19, late 40s and early 50s, he fell under deep suspicions by the FBI and uh, uh, other elements who believed he was a communist. And he quickly lost his security clearances. He was under deportation. He was under all sorts that he was imprisoned. He was mistreated. Uh, he was a brilliant and very vain, uh, proud man and became infuriated at the treatment that he received in the 1950s 
uh, feeling it was a betrayal of his contributions to the war effort just a few years before. And so in 1955, because of his mistreatment in the United States, Qian decided to return to China in the midst of his career and became the father of China's own missile program. So he's driven out of the United States, out of his suspicions. He had every intention of staying in the United States. His children were born in the United States and were US citizens. But uh, this racial and political fear of him as an Asian of China led to this disastrous consequence of him taking his brilliance uh, to uh, out of the country and helping China develop its own missile program. Uh, the surveillance of Chinese scientists has uh, been uncovered in uh, shocking places. Many of you know Zhang Lintian, uh, also an engineer. He had been the chancellor down uh, at UC Irvine, where I knew him, and then became the chancellor, vice chancellor at UC Irvine, and then he, UC Berkeley chancellor until um, he had suffered a terrible stroke in 1997 and died. But a, a brilliant man, a wonderful man, a very progressive a leader, um, who it has turned out now by the research uh, researchers at UC that he had been under FBI surveillance himself and wondering about his uh, his uh, uh, loyalty to the United States. This is some of the things which have been revealed uh, where, where Tian talks about uh, yeah, all this, this stuff about Tian being having communist sympathies. Um, 1974. Now, uh, in the 19, uh, later on, as uh, China and the United States develop relationships, there's this, even though as the two open up and develop economic and cultural relationship, there's always an underlying uh, suspicion in the United States of China, which uh, included the suspicion of Chinese intellectuals who were in the United States in increasing numbers. And I show this ma magazine cover to illustrate this point and the racialization of this uh, fear. Um, I, I find this fascinating image here of what I call the racial eye of the Chinese eye, that's one of the racial features that racial prejudice groups focus on is uh, the Chinese eye. And this is now the spy eye uh, that uh, then results as he's in the next Cold War, this was now 1999, you know, 20 years, 25 years, 23 years ago, but the Chinese spy scandal, they talk about one whole, which becomes one whole lead who was falsely accused of being a spy. And many of you know his uh, very difficult story, tragic story where he suffered uh, terribly by the FBI of the guy's suspicion of being a uh, uh, spy for the PRC, even though he was from Taiwan and had uh, actually reported for the FBI itself uh, on his trips and on Chinese scientists. Uh, but then he himself came under suspicion and scrutiny, but then was um, absolved of any wrongdoing after suffering terribly. Uh, in recent years, this has resurfaced again with a number of high profile cases. Jerry Chen, who was uh, born in China, naturalized in the United States in 1997, and then went to work for the National Weather Service. She's a hydrologist. Uh, and she got arrested. And, and again, eventually all the charges were dropped against her. There, there's a, but very there's a, a documented pattern of um, a high uh, of arrests by the FBI of Chinese ancestry scientists who uh, much higher than other nationalities or racial groups who who, uh, who, who whose cases are later on dropped and uh, the, the, the Chinese suffer many higher uh, arrests and then also uh, unsubstantiated charges. Uh, in these cases. One of the saddest, because I knew Shou Chang Zhang uh, here on the right, uh, was a colleague of mine at Stanford, a brilliant physicist. People thought he was in line for the Nobel Prize. He had been born in China, had come to the United States and done his uh, 
doctoral work here and it's a, I was in China. And in December 2018, uh, he committed suicide uh, by jumping off a condo in San Francisco, his condo in San Francisco. Uh, a few days before, you can see you know, November 28th, the Hoover Institution released this uh, inflammatory report uh, that mentioned that the drafts mentioned Shoshang as one of those elements that was working for the PRC to undermine American interests. And we wonder, you know, to what extent Shoshang knew what he knew he was being surveyed, surveyed, uh, and whether this contributed to his depression and his taking of his life. Uh, Xiao Shang Qi, Xiao Qing Qi, Qi is also another physicist more recently whose uh, home was invaded by the FBI. He was arrested in front of his family at a physics department at Temple. Again, another case where uh, they accused him of appropriating some technology he had worked on. Uh, they charged him with some uh, 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 misuse, they said, of technology he developed in developing uh, hand warmer instruments to warm your hands like you're going skiing but somehow they thought that he was doing something inappropriate and in in a wrong and arrested him and put him through hell for the next few years now in the midst of all this stuff here this is the latter you know teens this there's this incredible article in foreign policy very distinguished public uh, uh journal that, uh, that uh, speculated about this, this issue. Would Chinese and the United States be rounded up during war, last the Japanese had? Uh, and you can see this was now four years ago. Um, but already, you know, people were thinking about this and this, they reproduced this map here of Japanese American internment facilities. And very, very scary. Now, even more recently, some of you know about uh, uh, after, even after Trump is gone, uh, with Democratic Institute, Republic, uh, administrations now, but the drumbeat against China has continued in many ways. Uh, and the FBI director came under fire for this uh, portrayal of Chinese as potential, in the United States as potential threats. And uh, this was all part of the China and it became so-called China initiative where the FBI would direct its attention to what they believe, what they called the existential threat that China posed to American economy and national security. And there was a China, a Chinese American connection. In, in the primaries that just ended yesterday, uh, or a prominent Democrat in Ohio, uh, Tim Ryan, uh, who some call him a de Democratic Trump, uh, issued much of the same kind of rhetoric that Trump did um, some years before and others. Uh, that is to demonize China, which is not to say there's no problems between China and the United States, but the drumbeat against China and to see it as a hegemonic threat an all society threat against the United States. It's us versus China. Again, this nationalism, uh, China's out manufacturing us left and right. Somehow China's being unfair and we're just being picked on, uh, which was uh, he, the message he repeated over and over again. And he won quite handily in yesterday's uh, primary. And then there was this curious case that I uh, also during the you know, campaign or, uh, for the uh, uh, primary. Uh, and, and Ohio Democratic Senate candidate is being criticized by, by his use of fortune cookies in his campaign against the Republican uh, incumbent, Rob Portman. Um, this uh, Ted Strickland created fortune cookies, actually baked fortune cookies 
to distribute outside Cleveland uh, Center with a message inside the fortune cookie criticizing the Republican record on trade. Rob Portman, the best senator China's ever had, as the fortune cookie reads. Uh, people just shook their heads uh, about why they would do such a thing and to use this symbol of Chinese restaurants and Chinese Americans as part of a political uh, message. Uh, now, let me just end here by pointing out if you could step back to think there's a certain incongruity. What's this incongruity? Well, I started out talking about the late 19th century, how China was seen as weak and poor, the Chinese in the country as being laborers and uh, corrupt uh, uh, we, uh, um, and uh, diseased. And uh, that was uh, cited as reasons for why Chinese should be, could be uh, attacked uh, because China was weak and the Chinese here were weak and diseased. Now, here we are in the 21st century. China is strong, growing stronger economically, uh, as we all read about all the time. And Asian Americans and Chinese Americans, by some metrics, are doing better than ever. More highly educated in many sectors. Uh, economic, uh, socio high, uh, high proportion in higher socioeconomic categories, uh, over represented, as said, in, in elite institutions of higher education. Certainly, the profile of China and Chinese Americans is 180 degrees different from what it was in the late 19th century. And yet, we have a similar kind of characterization of the danger of China and Chinese Americans now to the United States, even though the characterization seemed to be completely different. So it's sort of an irony. I'm not quite sure what to call it, but it's a very strange juxtaposition between 100 and something years ago and today, 140 years ago and today, and we have a similar outcome of suspicion, violence against Chinese Americans. We also have more Chinese Americans in politics and in business, in the entertainment industry. In some ways, the, this is the best of times. Certainly in my lifetime, I'm sure others are gonna testify that I would never have imagined seeing all the Hollywood productions featuring Chinese and other Asian Americans, seeing the Chinese and other Asians in the halls of Congress and in local state houses, on school boards and becoming so active in politics, uh, unlike anything I saw when I was growing up. And yet we have maybe the worst violence against Chinese Americans in social violence in the streets than I've ever seen also in my lifetime. So there's some interesting comparisons. So I'm gonna stop here and we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you, Gordon. And I really appreciate the, the background and actually there's some great images that that uh, really illustrate the, uh, the phases in history that we have gone through uh, from uh, being uh, depicted as rat eaters and and uh, people who who lived a, a totally alien left lifestyle and, and that's one of the points you make is that we, we always keep having to prove ourselves who gets to be American, you know, what, uh, what defines us? Uh, will we ever be accepted as uh, uh, whole Americans? So uh, while I'm, I'm talking, by the way, please do send in your uh, questions uh, through the chat. I've got a, a couple so far, but in the meantime, I, I neglected to, uh, greet some of our uh, distinguished uh, uh, community friends out there. Uh, there are some folks from uh, uh, your, some of your, your academic colleagues, Gordon, uh, UCLA uh, Asian American Studies. I see Valerie Matsumoto. Hi, Valerie. Oh, hi, uh, hi. Let's see, Clay Doobie from USC, uh, uh, US China Institute. Uh, 
We have uh, Sufan Chung is on the line with, uh, uh, with uh, UNLV, uh, and then also Minjo from uh, the UCLA's Asia Pacific Center. So, and, and of course, everyone out there is important, and I really appreciate all of you joining in, uh, including some of my uh, uh, LA City School classmates uh, who are scattered around here in California. Uh, and some of uh, the uh, audience here have parents who were in, fathers who were in World War II. What more American can you be than uh, risking your life in in war, uh, it's something that we, we often have to ask ourselves, you know, what do I have to prove to show that I am American? Uh, I vote, I uh, go to school, I, I have a job. So what does it take to prove that I am fully American? I also want to welcome, by the way, a, a couple of people I see who are from the uh, San Gabriel Lodge of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance. CACA LA Lodge is a, is a community sponsor, and uh, we uh, do uh, welcome and, and embrace everyone to, to join in this discussion. Um, so the first question I'd like to get to is uh, from Lorraine, who uh, asked, uh, wants to, to hear from you, Gordon, on this. Uh, does the how does the anti-Asian movement compare and contrast with uh, American policies and ideas and the justifications for Afro-American, African-American slavery? In other words, when when that debate was uh, being discussed more than a century ago, 150 years ago, uh, how does that compare with some of the uh, language that we hear today in the anti-Asian. Is, is the question about the historical language or language today? I, it's probably, uh, I'm going to guess it, it means both. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, one could note that a lot of the attitudes haven't changed and maybe you can compare. Well, I, I, there's a lot to talk about and I'm really quite honored and uh, flattered that uh, there's a turnout is uh, robust and I see so many great friends and people, very, very uh, lovely people that I know uh, from across uh, the, from the universities. And thank you for being here. Um, but uh, 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 and I'm a little bit intimidated now. I know so many people who are as specialists <laughs> on this talk and I appreciate your listening in. Now, let, let, let me just uh, quickly respond to that question, uh, but in this way um people can say well there's quite there's, there's similarities you know they're both african americans and, and asian americans black and yellow peoples were dismeaned seen as inferior seen as undesirable in the united states uh and deserving of violence and certainly restriction of their rights and exclusion from society there are lots of parallels there are lots of similarities that can be be made there are also dramatic differences of course the African Americans and their millions were enslaved in the United States, and that's something which is so hard to grasp of how of, of the suffering, but also the deep implications and the historical legacy of the centuries of sl slavery on the soil of the United States uh, has for us till today. Now, all that put out, all that aside, we can talk about other similarities and differences. One one other comparison that I think about is that. Um, in the view of, of, of Asians and Chinese here, as I tried to show in some of the slides, is that there's this fear, not just of inferiority, but a perverse sort of superiority. That it was the whites could suppress the, the yellows could overcome the whites. Now the whites didn't like blacks, but there's very little uh, evidence to show that many whites thought that blacks could overrun, take over, and subdue or subjugate whites. But that was not the case for the yellows. And the yellows from the yellow peril, the yellow peril was a mortal threat, an existential threat 
to the West. Uh, you, ha you have no comparable Fu Manchu of a character, sort of an evil character in uh, that we know from Holly. Now, Fu Manchu, in fact, was Eurasian, and he had two or three PhDs, including from Harvard and Berlin University or Oxford or somewhere like this. He was a brilliant scientist who was obsessed with the white race because the white race so uh, insulted him that he wanted to uh, uh, get back at whites and rule the world. So that's a, it's a curious kind of evil villain. And, and as I showed in all these different, different ways, both historically and today, there's this fear of, of Chinese not just being undesirable, but also threatening and dangerous because of uh, capability of numbers, certainly, but also abilities in various ways and conniving ways um, that, that uh, we see. And, and that's a particular feature of, of the hatred uh, that often comes out against uh, 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 Chinese Americans. See, that, that, this is the perverse sort of flip side of the model minority, as is often said, is that the, you know, the model minority is, is just wonderful kids in schools and all this, but, they, but there's this dark side of the characterization that you can't compete against the model minority. You can't compete against these Asians. They're for various reasons both the intelligence but also they're they're not quite playing on the level fairly um and they're, they're not quite american so uh, this is this this idea of the chinese um uh and african americans is, is a uh interesting contrast and maybe there's a, a fear that maybe on the other side of the pacific people are just simply better at manufacturing than, than, than we are. I think historically, you know, there had been this brisk trade in, in tea, in porcelain, in silks. You know, that, that imbalance began centuries ago. So it, it didn't necessarily start with the uh, labor uh, coming here or people coming here in, in large numbers. Yeah, well, some people say, Eugene, that you know the manufacturing in China is just now instead of having coolies over here, you got coolies back in China, and then doing the same type of mass, faceless, uh, mindless labor uh, that white Americans can't compete against. Yeah, uh, but that's always been an argument, uh, whether it's for labor in on plantations in the Caribbean or or Malaysia or uh, uh, workers in in uh, sweatshops in New York. So uh, you know, we, we always have that, that challenge. Uh, kind of a related question from Sufan Chung is uh, compare anti-Asian uh, hate versus anti-Jewish uh, attitudes or policies. Yeah, well, I think there are many comparisons and I think that's in some ways the closest comparison to other experiences is between recent Asian American and Jewish experiences. So the sort of, sort of characterizations of, of, uh, of, um, of, of both communities. And I, I think it's not a coincidence that a number of uh, Asian American civic organizations and activist organizations are partnering, are partnering with Jewish organizations to learn from their work on how to respond to anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish violence that is, just, that is on the rise in the country as well. I mean, there's terrible figures about in the past few years about the open resurgence of, uh, of um, anti-Jewish sentiment, violent sentiment and, and murders. So I, I think there are is something there. Now, what are, what are some of the similarities? Well, you, you, again, you have a community, the Asian American community is complicated because of ethnicities and also many class the range of differences, but there's this view that the Asians are somehow privileged, like Jews are privileged. Somehow they're not quite deserving of the privilege or the funds, the money that, that are being that they have. Uh, that they're overrepresented in this and that way. That they're somehow uh, clannish, 
and secretive and you can't really know and there's, there, there's somehow a racial conspiracy. I mean, that's the fundamental of anti-Semitism. It's a racial conspiracy. But there's a sense too, the Chinese, you can't trust Chinese and other Asians because you can spire against uh, uh, whites. Um, so I, I'm also looking at a question on the chat here about perpetrators of anti-Asian hate are also uh, African-Americans. Well, I would respond by saying, one, I think the media has emphasized those terrible crimes. Uh, those who do follow these, these, uh, the, the, these incidents point out that, that African-Americans are not so-called overrepresented as perpetrators, but are seen or given more attention by the media. And then I would say also that they have very high profile, right? the violent street crimes, which, which get picked up uh, by um, you know these cameras, these uh, video surveillance cameras that are everywhere now, and we do see a lot of these pictures, but um, we don't see pictures of of uh, other of many other other incidents. But I said, well, why African Americans? Well, they're not immune to some of this, the vile that comes out from the the top uh, elites, like Trump and uh, for example, who, uh, who 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 have targeted Chinese and others. And uh, African Americans who have many grievances also you know, are taken, some believe, by uh, this uh, accusation and see Chinese and other Asians as enemies uh, and the cause of their own problems. So that's that's how a, 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 some quick responses to that good question. There, actually, uh, more questions, and I think I can read uh, quickly, but. Uh, uh, and first of all, uh, uh, some some comments. Uh, uh, Valerie, of course, thanks you for your presentation, and expresses sadness about hearing about more of these recent cases against the scientists. That, that doesn't seem to end. And is, is there any way? Uh, as I guess uh, another question I, I saw here: you know, How do we combat that, this? How do we elevate? the uh, perception or the image of these, you know, we, we have uh, these cases and they uh, end up uh, uh, maybe either the FBI or the government or whichever agency is persecuting these scientists, they, they drop the case. Uh, but then what could we do? Uh, when Ho Lee was in solitary confinement for a long period of time. So what has been done to really uh, help or, or prevent uh, the, the, this ongoing uh, perception that somehow Chinese scientists are, are spies? Well, uh, to, to, um, a serious important question, central question, and I think we all want to know what can we do to stop this, this hatred, this violence? Uh, I can't really, if I had the answer, <laughs> I would certainly share it widely, but but other than to point out that that uh, that in some ways I'm encouraged by the response to anti-Asian violence, it's been terrible suffering, but it's also been heartening to me to see so many people who have come out against um, the uh, violence, particularly young people. Demonstrations all around the country on college campuses and communities. Efforts to call, form multiracial coalitions, including with African Americans, local African -American churches, and other civic groups, uh, political figures from Washington to the local level who have spoken out. We, as I said, there are more political figures who've taken very, very strong stands to call out. Uh, we see the response from Hollywood uh, the, you know, more attention given to representation, positive representation. Uh, so I'm, I'm hardened by those um, developments, e even though maybe in spite of all this violence that this continues to go on. But I think it may be an energized, a moment of energy, ener an energizing moment, uh, maybe somewhat similar. Uh, and I'll maybe kind of leave it here because I have to sign off in a minute. It's sort of a, a Vincent Chin moment, you know, I've come out of tragedy that there was a emergence of pan-Asian solidarity 
and unity and understanding about the problem of race in America that came out of Vincent Chin's death. Uh, and it may be that we now have going forward a much heightened sense, including, for example, those who are in this uh, discussion, and I've given talks like this uh, elsewhere, and many others have uh, uh, to different audiences, that we're bringing attention to this problem like never before. Uh, and cities such as uh, San Francisco and San Jose and others uh, are uh, uh, passing uh, resolutions uh, expressing regret uh, for the past, for the violence done against uh, Asians in the past, uh, in the 19th century, and hoping to uh, have some type of reconciliation with different communities. So in sum, I, I think we all, it, it comes down to each individual, one of us, to take stands, to help educate friends and relatives and others, and, and to call out problems when we see them. At the same time, and I mean, mean this in all seriousness, of being careful ourselves. Um, at the height of the violence, it's subsided a bit now, but I, I was talking to friends, including other colleagues in academic institutions around the country, and to the person, people expressed fear uh, of going out in their neighborhoods, uh, let alone going to the subways in New York City. Um, so uh, it, I think that we may be seeing a sea change in consciousness among the elite Asian Americans, the scientists, educators, people who had some privilege before, and now realize that they're not so immune to prejudice as maybe they once assumed. And all the way down to the community level, where the people have a better sense that, of the need for us to take care of each other. Gordon, I think we, we could spend another hour in discussion and conversation and, and really, uh, I apologize to everyone. I, I don't think we can uh, take any more questions, uh, but, and I know that you have a, a teaching schedule as I'm sure some of you others out there do too. I, I do see one question from New Zealand and uh, she has uh, indicated really surprise and, and, and maybe a little shock too that knowing that there, there has been this longstanding problem here uh, with race. So uh, of course, you know, countries like Australia, New Zealand had their own head tax and uh, there was always this concern or fear about immigration from China. Well, uh, thank you, Gene, uh, and others for inviting and listening. I wish we could have been in person and we could have had a conversation as opposed to just this chat. But I hope uh, you, you'll take something away from the discussion and we can all try to think of ways to answer the very good questions that have been posed uh, tonight. So thank you. It's great. And thank you, Gordon, for, for coming back as a, a repeat speaker, because we always are uh, uh, welcome the opportunity to hear more from some of your work and some of your research. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is just uh, let you know about our upcoming programs. Uh, first of all, if uh, Alicia, you could put on the, the next screen for everyone. Well, we have an upcoming program, but let me just verbally uh, share with you. Uh, I see uh, Jan Lee Wong is, is uh, in the audience here and Jan Lee's family is from Riverside, and, uh, which uh, was really one of the communities in the Inland Empire where Chinese had a, an important presence economically and, and socially. Uh, the upcoming month's program for June is going to be about the history of Asians in Riverside. We're talking about Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, and Korean Americans. I, I'm sure that some of you wonder why uh, on the USC campus, there is a Dosan An Chang Ho uh, uh, house where uh, 
where uh, one particular department is housed, or why is the four level interchange, the uh, Pasadena freeway crossing the Hollywood Trio, why is that, why is that called the Dosan Han Chang Ho intersection? Uh, why do, uh, do many Chinese Americans, well, why did, how were many Chinese Americans purchase property in their children's name? Well, that really had to do with a special court case in, uh, in Riverside. So we look forward to really hearing more about our history, our Asian American history in Riverside. It's all really part of the whole process of how we can become or have become Americans. You know, we're, we're just still, as, as we heard from Gordon, you know, we're still constantly fighting that battle, trying to, to uh, work through this illusion that we, we can't become full-blooded Americans. But after 150, after 200 years of our presence here, we really have to tell our stories. So that will really help show how Asian Americans, Chinese Americans have helped build America. So we welcome you to join us, uh, the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California uh, has been providing uh, programs as, as uh, Susan mentioned at the beginning. We have a newsletter, we have a website. Just go to our website at chssc.org. You will see videos, you see uh, photos, you see our archival collections. Uh, you can go to our YouTube channel and see all of our past programs. Uh, we are a very dynamic organization. We have uh, new and old people <laughs> involved. Uh, we have a broad and diverse range of, of audiences participating in our efforts. Uh, next week, we have a scholar coming in to study or to learn more about the relationship between uh, Chinese Americans and Chinese who were in the uh, borderlands of Mexico, in the northern Mexico. And, uh, we ourselves have been uh, fortunate to, pub to have published some work about that particular subject. And we're looking forward to hearing what this particular student who's working on a dissertation will have to say or what questions she will be asking. So we uh, love that you're all able to join in and participate and share your, your knowledge uh, as well as ask your questions. Uh, please do feel free to ask any follow-up questions to uh, our uh, email through our uh, website at chssc.org, chssc.org, or our uh, email address at info at chssc.org. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next month and in the future. And please feel free to contact us anytime. We wish you a pleasant evening and We'll see you again. Thank you.